the time of our panelists and uh, on our agenda. And uh, yeah, at that, uh, this is uh, the community announcement session. Is uh, is there anybody from uh, the, the audience that wants to share something about what they're working on or uh, want to get introduced to a certain idea or someone? And now's your, uh, now's your chance. <laughs> cool. Sorry to Bogard, BitAngels is always accepting applications. If you want to pitch your company, bitangels.network slash join, it's free. Yeah. And we are, we are working on virtual sessions. Edward is involved. So yes. um, all are welcome. Submit your application. And um, yeah, there's, there's no catch. And uh, check our calendar. You can attend one of our events. I'll, uh, I'll put the, the link up on the, on the chat box right now. Any other community announcements? Yeah, Victor, don't you have a, a, <coughs> another meetup happening? Yeah, I, I want to let uh, the, the attend other attendees to go first. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Hey guys. Well, I guess I'll just um, I'll just say hi. Um, I don't have uh, any actual announcements. Happy to be with you guys today and. Uh, you know, uh, um, listening to uh, what you guys have to say. Interesting times with the happening happening and uh, COVID at the same time. We're kind of stuck at home, so it's a uh, I mean, perfect time to uh, you know get some knowledge, right? Absolutely. And any other community announcement? Okay, since there's no more, I, I will just make a. Uh, uh, an announcement another about uh, DeFi Toronto, uh, which is another meetup. We are a good partner with Bitcoin Bay, and we <clears throat> we have a meetup this uh, Thursday uh, where we have two guest speakers uh, coming. One is from Loopring, which is a decentralized exchange. Uh, another is from Open, uh, decentralized uh, insurance uh, project uh, for DeFi, and uh, and one of our co-organizer Jesse will uh, share some of his perspective on Bitcoin hacking. So that's uh, this Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. You can find out more uh, information on on meetup.com of our webpage. Cool. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll help you out, Victor. I'll get that link and put it in. Oh, thank you. Ready to go? Would you like to start? Yeah. And uh, are the panelists of uh, Eden, Tony, uh, uh, Richard? Are you are you ready to start as well? Sure. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. All right. So uh, yeah. I'll stop the share screen, and now it's on to you, Victor. Okay, I will share. <clears throat> My, my screen, uh, um, where do I share? Yeah, and uh, just a quick disclaimer, we are recording uh, this session. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let's start. Uh, first, uh, thank you for our panelists to join us and thanks for everyone to, to be here in, in the late afternoon. I know you probably, uh, usually at the time you'll have dinner with your family, but I uh, appreciate you, you being here. So, <clears throat> so today uh, we, we, our topic is related to capital raising uh, as, a, as a blockchain company. Uh, particularly we want to address uh, the, the topic, this topic for Canadian startup. Uh, I know uh, you know, blockchain space has a lot of innovation. Uh, so, as a, you know, as Canadian, we the, uh, here Bitcoin Bay, we want to support a Canadian startup as much as possible. And today, we have uh, three experts in this area. We want to uh, know their thoughts in this space and also get their advice uh, for startups and on how to more effectively raise uh, 
with capital. And today we have our three panelists, uh, Richard Titus, uh, who is the co-founder and the general partner of Art Fund. And the second uh, panelist is Aiden Daliwa, who is a global managing director of Complex uh, Network. Uh, previously, he was a partner and head of the crypto economics at the Outlier Venture, which is another VC fund, um, which is very relevant to our, uh, her ex his experience is very relevant to our topic today. Then we have Tony Kai, uh, Toronto-based uh, DeFi Bitcoin lending platform, uh, which re recently uh, raised capital, successful raised capital. So uh, congratulations to uh, to Tony and congratulations to Aiden for um, for his new role at uh, Complex. Uh, before we dive into uh, questions, uh, I just want to show you a few slides so be, to to set the stage and give uh, everyone uh, a starting point. Uh, about the topic we're going to discuss. So uh, this is a, a slide showing the number of fund, uh, number of run of a crypto fund uh, capital raising uh, over the last few years, and also amount of the capital has been raised for the blockchain uh, startup. Uh, I got this chart from uh, Coin Telegraph, and as you can see. 2018 is the height of the capital raising, uh, both in terms of uh, amount of capital, but also in terms of number of the round uh, raised for uh, blockchain. And uh, last year is pretty good, but not, but it's only about half of the amount raised as in 2018. Uh, this chart is more breakdown by quarter, it, I got this from a different source, a CI uh, insight, CB insight. And uh, uh, you can see quarter by quarter and how much capital they raised uh, each uh, quarter. And uh, for in 2019, uh, uh, the Q3 is actually pretty good. It's over uh, $1 billion was raised globally for the blockchain startup. Uh, but by far, the Q3 in 2018 is the largest one, uh, over $1.4 billion. Uh, in Q4 last year, here are some of the top uh, round of capital raising, uh, like a figure uh, which raised uh, over $100 million. Um, Big Ripple raised $200 million. Uh, digital asset holding raised 35 million, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is some some of the big, bigger round of the capital raising. And of course, uh, we want to know how much Canadian startup raised. So I dive into uh, a website uh, called BetterKids.com, which focuses on the Canadian startup scene, and I was able to find. A uh, few uh, uh, capital round raised by Canadian startup. Uh, of course, the most recent one is Atomic Loan, and uh, congratulations to Tony, uh, uh, which raised $3.4 million. And last year, 2019, I, well, I was only able to find three Canadian companies who raised capital. Uh, the Knox, which is Montreal based, they focus on digital asset. Uh, Custody. Uh, the second one is uh, BDAP, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, based in Vancouver, and they focus on uh, blockchain-based uh, digital uh, content management. And then we have one more from Montreal, Diffuse, which uh, working, which is working on uh, blockchain API. So, um, so you can see the amount of the they raise is quite small. Uh, tend to be in you know, 5 million to 10 million uh, area uh, or below 10 million uh, around. Um, so uh, one of the interesting topic we're gonna to discuss is that uh, I'm gonna ask our panel is to, ask, to ask them to compare their experience uh, between raising capital in Canada and raising capital in US. 
Okay, now we uh, move on to our uh, uh, panel session. Uh, before we start, I just want to ask our uh, three panels, each each person will spend uh, maybe a minute, uh, just introduce themselves a little bit and maybe tell tell the audience uh, your your business, how, how is that uh, uh, doing uh, in, in the blockchain space. Um, how about Richard, would you like to start first? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Richard Titus. I go by Titus. I'm a serial entrepreneur, <clears throat> angel investor. Um, most relevant to uh, everyone here is I'm a board member and fellow at the uh, Creative Destruction Lab. It's one of the biggest accelerators in the world and, and helped uh, create the blockchain stream there, as well as being involved in AI and clean tech. Um, I have a fund called ARC, uh, which has been about three years old. We spend a lot of time doing uh, blockchain advisory. We've done six investments in the blockchain space. And we're currently, sadly, thanks to COVID, raising money a little slower than usual for fun too. Aiden? Sure. So my name is Eden Dollywall. Um, I was recently, uh, for the last three and a half years, a partner at Outlier Ventures, uh, which is an investor in the uh, Web3 space, uh, and recently uh, launching a, um, a Web3 accelerator called uh, Basecamp. Uh, I've recently left uh, Outlier to lead the uh, global uh, ecosystem development for a layer one blockchain project called, called Conflux Network. And um, I'm an associate at CDL um, and, um, and a mentor at the, at the base camp, the Outlier Ventures Accelerator. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, Tony? Thanks, Victor. Um, so I'm Tony. Uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Atomic Loans. Um, and uh, what Atomic Loans is, it's a uh, protocol for non-custodial Bitcoin-backed loans, uh, where you know uh, holders of Bitcoin they're able to collateralize uh, their bit, some of their Bitcoin in order to get liquidity uh, in in a stable coin uh, to fund some of their expenses, uh, to pay bills, to to double down or leverage uh, their Bitcoin. Um, and uh, before that, um, uh, before starting Atomic Loans, uh, I was a, a developer at a Consensus uh, on their uh, open law team, which was working on um, legal agreements uh, on Ethereum. And then uh, before that, uh, I was a uh, student at uh, the University of Waterloo with their computer science program. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Tony. Okay, let's dive in, uh, you know, our uh, discussion. Uh, you know, to, I would say after 2000, the, the crash of Bitcoin in December 2017 uh, or early uh, January of uh, 2018, the, the, the market has been uh, dying down uh, a, a bit. Uh, from three of you, from your perspective, uh, how, would you, how would you describe uh, the startups in, in, in the blockchain space? Uh, do you see uh, there's more... Um, more startup, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, if they, if you see what kind of a project do you usually encounter in what app, what type of uh, the blockchain project? Richard? Um, yeah, so I'll go first. It's kind of interesting. So two years ago, we started the blockchain stream at CDL. And the first year, almost every business that pitched us was a, either a DeFi business, a trading algorithm, or a wallet, or, uh, or, a few custodian solutions. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of it. Um, and, and Tendermint. <laughs> so, and obviously Tendermint was my favorite, but uh, it was interesting, right? At that time, a lot of the people in the room, we, we realized that there were like these two citizens in the room of, and CDL is a huge now accelerator and uh, they hate when I call it an accelerator. But it, it, what was interesting is the people who understood blockchain were real specialists. And then you had everyone else who was like, wait, is this a thing? Why does this matter? I think now this year, both CDL and outside of CDL, when I see companies, most people generally accept that blockchain is a, is a core technology as part of Web 3.0 and part of the next wave of technology and evolution. And what we're starting to really see is businesses using the blockchain, um, occasionally cryptocurrencies and some of the other technologies around DLT to build real business cases and real businesses that make money. So one thing I would note about my portfolio today is more than half my blockchain businesses have actual profitable businesses. 
and they're not just making money through uh, selling tokens to speculative investors. Uh, when, when you say uh, they are profitable, uh, do, you, do you mean they make profit in, in a decentralized way or in, in a more traditional centralized business model? I, I'm speaking very generally there in order to get to the half, the 50% number, but you know, these are businesses who have customers, um, whether they pay back their investment capital, no, I don't think most of them have, a few have, but mm. um, the ones who had security issues trouble did. But more broadly, they're on a month-to-month -month basis, more money comes in the door than goes out, or you know, arguably they're break-even. And that's pretty good for an industry and a technology that's less than eight years old. And yeah. particularly interesting to me is, and I, I call this the adjacencies, where we're starting to see businesses come around who are blends of some artificial intelligence, some digital ledger technology, a bit of uh, cloud computing, and some IoT. And there's a real business case to use that around the supply chain. And it's that at that point, being a DLT business, it's no longer like 1996 when I started in the internet business, but you're like, we're an internet business. It's like, we're just a business. We're using the tools of the trade to build solutions for our customers. Yeah. Uh, Aiden, yeah, I know you are yeah. also part of a CDL. Uh, what, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, I could jump in there with a couple comments there. So I, likewise, I know outliers sort of, uh, prided itself at uh, sort of pioneering what we call the convergence thesis, where um, where we think new sort of new data uh, economies develop at the intersections of blockchains, AI, and, you know, edge computing, right? That's mm -hmm. Richard mentioned. So I think, I mean, we're starting to see sort of real applications of, of, um, of, of these, I mean, of, of use cases, uh, business models in this space. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, and I think that's come up, that's come from, um, if you look at after 2017, ICOs pretty much died. Uh, I think you just, I mean, aside from the market just going, you know, uh, crashing, uh, I think you just had investors that were really tired of um, dealing with um, projects that, that have regulatory issues, mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, you know, find a, a valuation for crypto assets and instead just saying, look guys, if you got a, if you got a good business that you could build, um, we're willing to put in, uh, we're willing to invest um, and you know, we can find a, a valuation that's sort of good for everybody. Uh, you know, I think the market, the investor appetite for uh, crypto projects changed quite a bit, and I think the the market responded by you know producing uh, you know businesses and business models that were that were more appetizing. I see. Uh, Tony, do you have would like to share your experience with your team in the, in the startup team? Yeah, um, definitely echo uh, Richard and uh, Eden's thoughts there. Um, Clearly, like the amount of token projects is, has seen a, a great decline. Um, there's a lot less projects that are just trying to do blockchain for the sake of doing blockchain, which obviously mm. we saw a lot in the in the hype period. I mean, like one of the first questions that uh, that VCs are are keen to ask is like, um, you know, uh, is this something that can actually benefit from being a blockchain project, right? Mm. Uh, and like, I think VCs are now a lot more um, mature in their thinking about uh, about that kind of stuff and a lot better at screening uh, um, uh, companies around that. Um, and uh, I think there's also less um, less new layer one companies and, and projects. Uh, I think like uh, there's more stuff happening uh, rather than kind of all the layer one competition that's happening, that was happening back in the day during the hype, uh, during, during all the hype. I think like, there's a lot more consolidation towards some of these you know, a, a couple of specific blockchains or a couple of specific smart contract platforms, namely Ethereum. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously us uh, being in the DeFi space, uh, we're quite often exposed to um, DeFi companies. And uh, that's, I think that's been a sector that has seen a lot of growth uh, recently, um, you know, as, as well as in, in, in the funding space is getting a lot of funding, uh, more so than I, I think some of the other sectors in, in blockchain right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think there's there's definitely a lot more uh, experimentation around um, monetization. 
uh, and like basically not just monetizing on the basis of a token, like like Richard said, and 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 kind of you know trying out some other models. I think that's been a, a major focus of some of these companies as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of use case, um, everyone say that uh, you know uh, supply chain is 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 a good use case. Uh, Outside supply chain, uh, what what are the good use case for, uh, you know, rather than uh, rather than build a layer one protocol, uh, what's a layer two usage case uh, uh, have you seen? Yeah, I, I think like um, I think like in terms of like you know things building on top of layer one. I think like I mean like there's always. Uh, there's there's been there's been quite a bit of um, uh, work around uh, scalability solutions and, and layer two, um, especially on uh, around Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think like that's we've seen quite a few companies uh, pop up there that are doing some interesting work. I mean, uh, Lightning Network, uh, of course, Lightning Labs recently raised, and uh, I mean, it seems like they uh, they're definitely uh, is showing promise there. Uh, but like. Um, uh, in terms of layer two, like I, I think there's a lot of these scalability solutions and, and whatnot. But then, um, you know, there's also a lot of kind of like, uh, um, like I said, like uh, decentralized finance protocols that are building on top of some of these layer ones that have uh, uh, seen a lot of traction as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say like there's there's definitely an entire investment thesis around self sovereign identity and just mm -hmm. applications around SSI. Uh, mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, we're we're sort of hyper obsessed around DeFi, you know, sort of this crypto finance as, a, as an alternative uh, financial system. But there's also the, the sort of cello world of, of DeFi, which is, you know, how do we actually create uh, financial services for underserved markets, um, uh, marginalized uh, groups, you know, there's there's like cannabis businesses for example in the u.s that can't get a bank account you know mm -hmm. there's uh so there, there's you know those those type of applications out there i think those are there's a lot of opportunities to apply DeFi in a in a very practical way i think ssi is strong mm -hmm. um and you know i think tooling right there's still a lot of like of the web3 stack there's a lot of plumbing that needs to be sorted out. So um, yeah. middleware that could be built, integrations, APIs, there's businesses to be built around that. Okay, great. Uh, Richard, uh, what, uh, what other uh, application uh, you see uh, in the blockchain space that uh, is getting more traction in, in last 12 months? Well, it's funny, so I agree with everything Eden said. Um, I would actually add a couple of things. So I think what I call new banking, and I think everyone here knows that I sit on the Libra Association uh, mm -hmm. Management Committee. And so what's fascinating about that is not just Libra, but there's Libra, there's the metal, uh, you probably aren't super aware of this, this is more known in California, but metal and uh, work chain, which is Lynx, which is uh, Freddy Krueger's company are merging. And, they have a couple of spin out products of that. There's a wallet, which already in in integrates into Android and iOS and your wallet there. If you have a credit card mm -hmm. or a debit card, it's just a seamless exchange, wallet, currency. Bill at Abra and all the sort of interesting DeFi players have blown up and been really amazing. Um, so I think that, and, and the other thing that's happened is, at least in America, and I think in Canada it's a similar situation, we've had this interesting moment where our existing financial system, which is old and antiquated and a little crusty, is failing and it's failing because my government wanted to give me $1,200. It took them six to 12 weeks and probably mm -hmm. cost them mm -hmm. 20 to hundred of those dollars to send that to me. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And so everyone now knows like the, the curtains up, we all see the weird guy behind the wizard of Oz. And, and so that's going to accelerate the change. And many young people, I always used to say this, like people would say to me, oh, you know, Bitcoin, crypto, it came from the drug world. I said, well, yeah, somewhat. But what it actually came from is a bunch of young people, had a, their, their grandmother wrote them a check for their college fund, and they had some money in a, in a sort of crypto account that they used to buy and sell certain services and goods. And at the end of college, one of those was worth a lot more than the other, <laughs> and it wasn't the college fund. And so you had a generation of young people say, wait a minute, 
all of the things I've been told about the financial system aren't necessarily accurate. And that, that crack in belief is the beginning of a wave of change. And it happened in the 60s in social mores. I think in the 2000s, it was financial mores. And I think mm -hmm. the effect of this will to be create new financial giants. Some firms, I think HSP is one of these, will excel and, and will end up out ahead. But many firms, particularly those trapped in the old way of thinking about our money and, and our ability to move that money around and spend it and collect it and earn interest on it, that's all going to change. And alongside that goes some of the, the rise of stable coins and the rise of things like Libra. And so I think we're just about to see some, you, if you think the last six months was tumultuous in the financial markets, wait, just watch the, you know, hold my beer, watch the next 12 months, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a fascinating, bumpy ride. And I think stable coins, and not just the Libra and not just dollars, but many different stable coins are going to rise as sort of the new currency of the future. And I'm not sure some of the state sponsored ones might work, but I think it's actually going to end up a mix of different stable coins that drive a lot of international commerce. And, you know, I think the U.S. is missing a trick here in sort of not embracing and extending these like a Microsoft strategy. They're trying to sort of, like the newspapers did when I was in the newspaper business, they're trying to keep digital out. And that's just not mm -hmm. going to work. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I would say, which no one has talked about, which cracks me up, is the rise of security tokens. So I firmly believe that every part of the financial services markets, including the securitized assets markets, will be digitized. And I think it's going to happen much faster than everyone thinks. I, I've seen the number of small security changes rising in non-US, non-Western markets. We were involved in a bunch of security tokens early. And they, it was slow because you didn't have a buy side and sell side. You didn't have a lot of product and people didn't really know what it was. But I believe just like cryptocurrencies, just like stable coins, just like some of the other assets that we've been dealing with today, we're going to see a rise of those instruments. And lots of other derivative instruments, sorry for the pun, based on programmable money and programmable security interests that you can't do in previous systems. And, and that's going to be both revolutionary and probably shake the foundations of the existing systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, to follow up your question on uh, your uh, topic on uh, stable coins, uh, yeah. now, <clears throat> now we have uh, three types of stable coin. We have um, corporate stable coin like Libra. Then we have uh, maybe government stable coin. <laughs> I would disagree China. with that, but yeah, go on. <laughs> okay, and then China, uh, China or US or even Canada was thinking about issue our own fiat stable coin, and then you have. Uh, you know, decentralized stable coin like uh, Dai. Uh, so, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> I would argue Bitcoin. <laughs> Pardon? I would argue Bitcoin is sort of a stable coin. It's a stable coin for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of a cross-border payment uh, yeah. and uh, international international commerce, uh, which type of coin do you see? Like, a, if if a ten year, five year from now, uh, cross-border payment, do you think? people more likely to use uh, uh, which type of the uh, stable coin are more likely to, to get a track. So it's interesting. I, first off, I don't think these are fixed. I don't think these are fixed pillars where things fit in. I think this is a continuum. And over here at the far end is Bitcoin, which is an absolutely decentralized, ab absolutely governless, fixed, fixed, fixed volume cryptocurrency. And mm -hmm. over here is the Chinese currency, which is essentially a fiat government backed managed digital, digital currency and in between is an array of possibilities i think facebook probably is somewhere in the middle to be honest some of the stable coins trend a little bit towards regulated some of them are baskets of currencies like libra so that i think that's a little bit more decentralized in premise if not an action um but i think that what's going to be interesting is for the longest time the dollar was the default currency of choice like people just like and and with the money printer going as much as it is with the U.S. social political system in shambles, and, and frankly, the U.S. sort of stumbling in its response to COVID, I think the confidence in the U.S. being the dominant leader of the markets is is actually cracked. Maybe it, maybe we come out okay, maybe we don't. But just you know, I'll never forget the moment I realized my dad couldn't stop me from doing insert item X. The possibility that he couldn't stop me was enough to break the the limits on my behavior, uh -huh. and. This is, I think, the same thing with global markets. They're going to start seeking other forms of payment and other transaction metrics. And I think a lot of these stable coins and things like Libra, which are baskets of currencies, are going to be viewed as an option. 
mm -hmm. right? And I, I, it's funny, everyone always thinks it's about avoiding taxation. I think it's about actually having fair international business. Yeah. And I think some of the crazy stuff like the Irish sandwich or, I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, but like, you know, there's people at Deloitte and Arthur Anderson previously and lots of law firms who make millions and millions of dollars trying mm -hmm. to invent really sneaky ways to avoid taxation on transactions that should just be really fairly but singularly taxed. As opposed to currently, many of them, the reason they create those shenanigans is because there's like 15 layers of tax in a transaction at any given time. Okay. Uh, Aiden and Tony, do you have anything, any thought on stablecoin? Well, I think just that um, there's going to be a multitude of, I think, use cases. I mean, like Richard said, I mean, you're, there's, a, there's a huge sort of spectrum uh, within this sort of stable coin space, right? So you have crypto backed and then you have, you know, let's say fiat backed. Uh, and then in between you can have these baskets and depending on the use case, depending on the motivation, right? You're gonna have different sort of applications for these stable coins. So I think there's a huge world of like, just to explore. And I think, I mean, a lot of it frankly is politically, um, motivated too i think we can't sort of avoid or ignore the fact that you know there's definitely a um you know people out there that would like to see uh that well let's put it this way that that no longer uh want or feel confident in the u.s dollar and we would like to see some sort of alternative to that whether it's sort of some sort of mixed basket or whether it's bitcoin or whether it's uh you know, Chinese won, right? So I think it'll be pretty interesting uh, how this uh, moves forward, but I think there's just a, a huge world of opportunity. Yeah, um, I think I think it's definitely, stable coins are still um, very much, I mean, they're still very much at, its, at their infancy still. I think there's still a lot of room to grow. I think that like um, stable coins, like the growth that we've seen recently um, it's, it's, uh, it really, it really goes towards helping for, uh, enabling, you know, much better liquidity and even better trading pairs with, uh, mm -hmm. with Bitcoin and in the crypto ecosystem. I think that, um, I think that, um, stable coins, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting, right? Like we've seen kind of this, uh, migration of a lot of tether to, uh, from the Omni chain to, uh, to, to Ethereum. So that's been really interesting to see and seeing kind of Ethereum become this chain, uh, the stablecoin chain. Um, I think that like we've seen a lot of consolidation of stablecoins onto Ethereum. Um, so that's going to be something to keep an eye on uh, moving forward as well. Um, and uh, I think that something else that's, that's been interesting recently that I've noticed is that uh, especially like, you know, I, I can uh, and speaking to kind of like our interactions with our users and customers, that's, it's that like people have been uh, a lot more skeptical about um, about DAI recently, just I think because of the recent uh, uh, issues that they've had uh, on Black Thursday. And like, um, and I think that people have actually kind of um, shifted back and fallen back towards more of the centralized stable coins like USDC, especially here in the West. And then in, in, in the East, of course, uh, we... There's a lot more, uh, you know, um, uh, desire for for tether, um, so that's been pretty interesting to see as well. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, I, uh, the second topic you you mentioned uh, earlier is about uh, security security token. Uh, yeah. So when you say security token, will you refer to uh, security like a share, a company share, uh, or do you mean uh, tokenize a, 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 like a private asset like real estate? So yes, <laughs> and that is actually one of the problems okay. is it, it's for a hundred years or so, and I'm being, you can make the argument in lots of different ways. So you have the sort of ability to break out shares of company that goes mm -hmm. back to like the Dutch East Indies company and 300 years ago. And then you have sort of derivatives and options, which are a little more recent. And all mm -hmm. of these instruments are essentially the tokenization and then trading of a percentage of a contract or mm -hmm. and finding a counterparty. So mm -hmm. with digital, with, with blockchain, we can do all of this faster, cheaper, better, mm -hmm. and frankly, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so all of that's going to happen. And, and the beginning of this was sort of, you know, blockchain capital, issuing mm -hmm. a security token, a share, 22X, which we were part of. There were lots of exchanges like T0 who popped up. Mm -hmm. And the regulators have been very slow to allow mm -hmm. this activity to happen. I know in the UK you have token funder. Um, I think the regulators were just surprised by this. Like it, this is sort of, wait, wh no, we, we have a whole system for managing that. We can't change mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But just like money, I believe that change is inevitable. Now. And what's interesting mm -hmm. is you see the regulators, the OSC has given approval to one, I think possibly two exchanges now in the, in the King Canada. In the U.S., there are three or four who have, who have approvals and more that are in process. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see, you know, rule following, rule abiding companies starting to do listings, starting to allow, you know, trades. And maybe those will sit in front of or behind a brokerage. It doesn't really matter, actually. The mm -hmm. idea is that the assets are represented on a blockchain, which is mm -hmm. indelible and immutable. And mm -hmm. the most important part of this is it's going to break a bunch of things that the financial services market has been built on, which is double hypothecation. So I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone's going to get really nerdy here, but like at many points last year, Tyson Foods, there was 170% of the outstanding shares were available for purchase online. <laughs> That's because of yeah. double hypothecation. Right, same thing for gold. There's far more gold contracts out there than there is gold. And so mm. what that tells you is that's a bubble and it's a, it's a flaw in a system that's gonna be very hard to unwind. And that's what blockchain and, and security tokens in general will solve. Now, what starts to be really interesting is as these things mature and people start to be able to purchase them, what will that do to the old systems? And we don't really know that yet. And I think we're, you know, it's a journey so now we have some exchanges, we have some assets, which ones will be successful? Will it be real estate? Will it be gold back tokens? I don't really know, I'm, not a, I'm really not a trader. I just can see very clearly the trend line that the, the blockchain and programmability will transform absolutely that business. And it will mostly be done by insurgents, not by the, the legacy leaders today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said mostly because a few of them are moving very fast now. I feel like uh, when everybody thinks this, when you talk about security tokens, most people are thinking about issuance and mm -hmm. you know, there isn't well, really, true. I was going to go down that but, road, but yeah. Yeah. But, and there really isn't like a sort of um, investor comfort. I mean, they're just not sort of educated on what security tokens are, but I think security tokens, if you, if you, if you just look at it as digitized shares, as an example, I mean, private shares are so illiquid. There's just a massive market out there, right? If you can actually like di digitize shares and then create a marketplace around it, an exchange around it. it. You know, right now you have people with private shares, they wanna sell it, you know, they sell it for 25 cents on the dollar back to the founder, right? It's just, mm -hmm. there's no market for it, or it's a very mm -hmm. tough market. But even just simply digitizing shares and creating that market, I think you could start to, I mean, there's a, a ton of value to be unlocked and i think people will start to understand what you know like the the value of a security token yeah so there will be winners and losers uh, which yeah. the gap between this will be much wider i could just jump in for a second sure, just go ahead. to add a little more canadian perspective so okay. i agree with like obviously i totally agree with what richard said like i think blockchain is a good like a, an exponential and and you know still very low correlation opportunity low low, low correlation to the economy uh, mm -hmm. investment, um, but Canadian investors are very conservative, mm -hmm. right? Like they're very conservative, and they're also win trick one trick ponies. A lot of them, right? There's still you still have like Bay Street bankers investors, uh, you know, uh, who who do who who write angel and VC checks size checks mm. still like super focused on cannabis for example mm. Mm. and and i can't tell you like locally how nauseating it is to, <laughs> to 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 hear that ongoing sort of cannabis discussion going on and take and and uh all the all the 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 mind uh shared how much of that you get mind space that gets taken up around can cannabis so Mm. Uh, I'll digress again, but uh, okay. let okay. Tony have a few words in. Yeah, Tony, you know you raised capital successfully 
but based on the, 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 the main investor from U.S., uh, what's your experience uh, raising capital uh, both in Canada and U.S.? Yeah, um, it was interesting, right? Um, I think, like, to be honest, um, for us, we kind of, when we started raising, we didn't really even consider, like, approaching a lot of like Canadian investors we kind of like yeah. especially in the blockchain space um like 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 all like all the time we kind of hear about um you know just Canadian investors the more stingy they like to see a lot more traction before like investing valuations are comparably comparably a lot lower than than what we see in, in the U.S. and and whatnot um and so like to be to be frank like you know we were very much kind of focused on you know looking to the states uh, especially um uh the silicon valley funds um when we were kind of doing our raise um and um to, to echo um kind of so like we so uh, to add on to that a little bit more i guess that we 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 were I, I guess we were very fortunate in in the sense that we managed to close like just like one or two months before everything really hit. And, um, you know, from, by all accounts, you know, from, from talking to our own investors, from talking to other founders, um, you know, valuations are, are, are down at the moment, right? Um, people, uh, the, L, the LPs of the funds, they're telling their, uh, the funds that they've invested in to kind of limit their capital calls, right? Um, that's just kind of what we've been hearing. Um, and like, like Eden said, people, uh, these funds are a lot more focused on taking care of their own existing portfolio at the moment. And this is something that we've experienced, right? We've had like a couple of uh, portfolio live webinars with some of our lead, uh, lead investors uh, where, you know, they were just like open to taking questions. They were kind of telling us, you know, what are some of the things we need to consider in terms of protecting runway, protecting burn? How can we ex uh, limit uh, our burn and like maybe be able to do so without actually cutting personnel? Like what are the different ways we can do that? Right. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, like Richard said, but like on a different scale, we, we like, we, uh, I find that like, it's a lot easier to actually get a hold of our investors now. Like, and they're open to like having calls like the same day or the next day uh, before, you know, sometimes they have to kind of plan, or plan around things a bit more. They're busy traveling or they're hearing pitches. Right. Um, so um, that's, that's been interesting, but for us, um, something else that, maybe I'll, I can add is that like for um, it ended up being, I guess, a very uh, um, fortunate situation where we were a com Canadian company uh, raising USD from primarily uh, US companies. Um, as probably most of us know, like Canadian dollar has fallen quite a bit relative to USD. So that, so having, you know, a lot of our reserves in, in USD, that was very fortunate um, because it just extends our runway even, even further. Um, and, uh, and uh, I think like um, in part, I think like something that uh, um, Canadian Canadian companies should do more is kind of like you know don't like approach some of these, uh, especially in the blockchain space. Just because the blockchain space is is very global, um, and the blockchain VC investment space is also very global, is to not be afraid to kind of approach these global funds in in, in the states or even elsewhere, um, yeah, yeah. and uh, and and yeah, try to attract some of that capital. Well, Tony, uh, did you just, approach? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ed, Ed. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of things. One, uh, just one thing. Just for, since we're talking about Zoom calls, uh, I, I have had actually a couple or two or three calls uh, this past week, uh, where the conversation was about. You know, I, I like talking to this entrepreneur, but I just like because I can't be with them physically. It's just hard to invest, right? So it's a little different, I think, if you're Richard Titus and, you, and, and you're a known entity and you're having calls and like raising for your fund. But I do think that there is, it is a little bit harder when it's, a, it's an entrepreneur. You're able to get a hold of the investor, but the investor's kind of like, ah, like I still haven't been in a, in a room with you. I still mm. kind of, I haven't seen you in person. I do think that there is a little bit of a, it's a, it's a kind of an extra hurdle there. So is that a, just, it, it, it's for, not a barrier uh, for building trust. I think, I don't know if it's, look, I don't know if it's a barrier. I just know that there feels like there's a, it's, it's, it's just very tricky, right? Cause a lot mm. of times you're investing in 
the entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Uh, um, among other things, uh, right. well, especially you are investing in the entrepreneur. So, yeah. I mean, you you will want to have a good feel for the character, the the EQ, mm. you know, the acumen of the of the founder. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, I would say that's tough to do to, over Zoom. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I I haven't made any investments in people I didn't already know before the quarantine, but I was on a call with a bunch of VCs last week for it's kind of like a happy hour discussion thing, and this was an actual topic we talked about. And mm -hmm. more than half the VCs in the room had done deals where the majority of the sort of get comfortable phase after mm -hmm. interest had happened only on Zoom, or you know, mm -hmm. insert video conferencing here. And they mm -hmm. said, look, it's a little harder. You do more due diligence, mm -hmm. you dig deeper. And, but should, this one VC said, look, I'm in the business of deploying capital. Why don't I have to get the money back if I, don't, if I don't invest it? So I want to find the right investments. And this was a great deal. And I could, vet, I, they, you know, all my due diligence worked. And she said, I'd probably DD this more than the previous five deals, but I actually like the deal more now than I did before. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, but Tony, I think we're I... get used to new normal. As investors, yes, yeah. Uh, Tony, can I follow up one question with you? Uh, you you say that when you, you when you you feel that you, if you try to raise money from Canadian uh, investor, they tend to ask for more information. They want more more questions. Uh, do, you, do you feel that uh, Canadian investors are more uh, risk averse compared to the U.S. counterpart? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think that's just like uh, the culture of mm -hmm. KC, to be honest. Um, and uh, like, yeah, I mean, we we were we were chatting with uh, with, um, and I'll be frank, uh, we were chat we were chatting with um, like some of our friends, uh, founder friends here, who uh, raised Canadian capital, and we were kind of getting their feedback on 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 our pitch and like on on kind of like our ask and 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 valuation and whatnot and they were they were like they were their eyes were just like like wide open at like what we were trying to raise and like what our what we thought our evaluation was at mm -hmm. uh, and uh th that was very interesting right um mm -hmm. uh, because just i think there's a bit of a definitely a bit of a divide especially you know with uh uh with how uh Sil silicon valley funds kind of look at investments and and the way they do their due diligence and and the way they think about kind of like uh, 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 you know, the, the, the way they kind of like invest in not what's has already been built and what ha you've already achieved, but kind of like mm -hmm. what the potential is and, and, and also mm -hmm. investing in the founders themselves. I think there's a big em emphasis on that in, in Silicon Valley a bit more from, from our experience. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's definitely re reflected in the different, uh, types of investment styles, I would say. Do you think that the, the conservativeness of the Canadian investor is more because they are not comfortable with the technology or it's true for all uh, uh, venture startup uh, in any industry? Yeah, um, hard to say there. Um, I think maybe Eden uh, and Richard can give a bit more um, context there, but uh, uh, I think like, yeah, like um, there's not that many. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry, go ahead, Tony, okay. go ahead. Uh, I, think, I think there's there's just not that many uh, funds that I know of that actively invest in, in blockchain and, and has that kind of expertise who's based in, in, in Canada. Obviously there are some, uh, and there also, there's also some like, uh, you know, U S funds or European funds who have partners or, uh, kind of, uh, staff here in Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, in terms of like funds that are like headquartered and based, uh, here in Canada, uh, not, not that many that I know of who invest in, in blockchain. So, so fundamentally, uh, Canada's economy is basically like, I was, for the most part, three industries. Okay? It's like financial services, commodities, and telecom, right? So financial services is highly regulated in Canada, right? Like we don't mm -hmm. let like foreign banks, even American banks come in here very, very easily, right? Mm -hmm. It's like very, very protected. We do the same thing with telecom, right? Mm -hmm. You can't come in here. It's just Rogers and Bell. That's it, right? No, no foreign entity right uh and then you know commodities is a very safe right it's very safe like you know you just you you just 
you know, take stuff out of the ground, out of the ground and sell it, right? And so we're this environment that we've created in uh, in Canada is just just like totally not risk taking, right? The culture mm -hmm. is not risk taking. It's really, we basically we we don't compete globally, okay? Uh, we don't let competition in the country, uh, and you know that trickles down to to uh, uh, to, to the in, investor mindset, right? Um, and and that's that's the overriding business culture that we have in Canada. So uh, if you look at the way our economy is set up, it doesn't foster risk taking, and uh, and you know we're we're I would say almost hyper regulated. Richard, do you have uh, what's your thoughts from a you know U.S. perspective? Uh, what do you see the difference? Between U.S. and Canada, yeah, um, in, in about the risk-taking culture, uh, you know, why is that different? Or do you so it's funny. Do you agree that's I, different. It is definitely different. Um, okay. I, I actually think there's a there are some amazing startups, founders, engineers, talent in Canada. I, I interact with them every day at CDL, but also just in my, before that, what part of why I went to CDL is I've had those experiences. I think there's a, it's a, it's actually not a skills gap. It's a confidence gap. And I would love to see that grow because I actually think Canada is an amazing place. And I feel like Toronto is like one of my second homes. Um, what's interesting is on the investment side, it's super inconsistent, right? I've dealt with some amazing investors in Canada who are more sophisticated in many ways than the ones I deal with in Silicon Valley, who are often just, you know, who basically jump on whatever train they read about on BC Twitter and, and they move quickly and they get a term sheet and they get into deals, but they don't really have a plan. Um, so I think there's probably, it's, it's inconsistent, but the biggest challenge for Canadian founders versus American founders is there's just more, there's more people deploying capital in America than Canada. I, I'm unconvinced that there's more money. I think a bunch of Canadian money would come to America anyways, but there's a lot of money in Canada and, and there's also a lot more tax subsidies and a sort of more, more company friendly environment in Canada than the US. You know, the joke I used to tell is in Canada, if you want to start a company, there's a million programs to help you do that. In America, if you want to start a company, the first thing that happens is they cut off your unemployment. <laughs> like, the very first thing they do is cut off your unemployment. So like, could we do anything else to encourage people not to start companies mm. than to stop giving you whatever benefits you're getting while you're doing that? That just doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, if I could just throw one more comment in, I think Shopify becoming the most valuable company in Can yeah, Canadian nice. history yeah. this week is going to help us a lot. So, I, I do. You, uh, do you think that the investor, Canadian investor, and U.S. investor, do they uh, one are more patient than others, or just simply less uh, less risky than others? They, do, what I mean is that do U.S. investors willing to wait longer to get a return back than Canadian investors? So, go ahead. I'm curious what you're going to say. Um, well, okay. So it's funny because so I worked in Europe and worked for a European VC, and now I'm working for a uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, a ch basically a Chinese uh, blockchain project and, and dealing with, uh, you know, our Chinese investors. And obviously mm -hmm. uh, I've been working with American investors for a, a while as well. So mm -hmm. I've, uh, w what I see is uh, I think there's all, first of all, just I, I, when I was in Europe, the one thing that the startup scene and even the investors always used to talk about American investors is just, there is just there is a there is a a real sort of visionary aspect to to American tech culture, right? Whether it's the investor or the founder, and and there's also a really strong can-do spirit, right? Mm. And and you just can't underestimate. And unless I mean I think if you're American, you don't really realize how much of that like the the whole confidence thing that you talked about, Richard. It's a really 
like inherent trait of Americans to just have that can do spirit. And like, we can see what, what, what the world looks like or what it should look like, um, you know, before it's built. And then you have like very pragmatic investors in other parts of the world that they want to see a good business. They kind of need to see in order to believe. And, um, and, and so I, I just think that there's a very, there's a, there's a, there's an understated sort of cultural aspect to the way Americans, American investors uh, go about um, signing checks versus maybe even the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, Ed, I think uh, probably is a good time to, to end uh, the panel discussion and then we open up uh, to our uh, uh, attendees to, you know, ask questions. For sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to put the guide for sharing, uh, uh, asking questions up right now. Uh, guys, thank you for the, the insightful topics that uh, you, you brought up. I'm, I'm sure a lot of our, our attendees are curious about like uh, uh, more things and uh, they have some stuff up their pockets. So uh, we have two ways for our attendees to, uh, to, to ask questions. So first way is to use the chat box feature on Zoom and, uh, and uh, Victor will be choosing three at random to ask questions. And I thought the way I look at for the hand, raising hand, the people yeah. who raise hand. Uh, yeah, well, sorry, are you saying you can't find it or what? Uh, no, 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 I say I, I suppose to look at the people raise hand in, yeah. the, in, in their, okay. Yes, yes. Um, Victor will be choosing um, uh, three people to like uh, to unmute so that they can ask their questions. And I'll be picking three questions from the chat box to, uh, to ask the panelists. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone want to ask a question? You can uh, raise your hand. You click the button, raise hand, and, and I will unmute you. Any questions? Well, while, uh, while people uh, uh, write a question or think of uh, one, I'm going to ask a question that was posed by Edwin uh, around 7.03. Uh, this seems to be to anybody in the panel. How does the panel feel about accredited investor rules and how STOs are supposed to, our STOs are supported to democratize access? So uh, yeah, I'll read it again. How does the panel feel about accredited investor rules and how STOs are supposed to democratize access? And that question is from Edwin on 7.03 PM. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Uh, well, I mean, I could unpack it a bit. Um, so I think a few years back, there was this trend around uh, crowdfunding and, and equity crowdfunding. And I'm pretty sure uh, that there was some uh, regulatory changes around making it um, uh, open to retail investors with some limitations. Um, and I think, it, Richard, you'd probably know this. Like, was it the Jobs Act? Is it, is, what was the what was it called in the U.S.? But I know that yeah. opened up, it it opened up retail investing, um, and so I don't I don't know if it's something that's necessarily like accredited investors for STOs. If if it's necessarily an issue that's like a, a new issue, and to my knowledge, uh, I could I could be wrong, but. Uh, I assume it's the same rules in place. Uh, retail investors would have limited access. So here's what's interesting that's happening. Um, first off, I saw a Hester, Hester Prynne from the SEC came and gave a talk. It was like one of the last things I did before we all got quarantined. And I was a little terrified I was gonna get COVID there because there was a lot of people from China or whatever. I was like, <laughs> I was absolutely convinced for like 14 days I was gonna get sick. 
but you know there is on the on the sort of horizon the exploration and i think that means they're going to do it of changing the the uh, sort of qualified investor uh, requirements i think we're going to see it was the jobs act that began this journey but i think we're on a journey to simplify the rules around raising money they've already said it's okay to communicate about the fact you're raising money and to market your business as, as part of that process to accredited investors. So I think that it's a slow and steady race. They don't want us to go back to the 1920s and snake oil salesmen and people buying things mm-hmm. they don't really understand. But the flip side is it doesn't make any sense that I can buy shares in a publicly traded company with too much debt. And I can't buy, and I can't buy a share in a company here in Silicon Valley. My friend works for it like that. There's a problem there and everyone recognizes it. I think they're just trying to work out within the existing rule set of how to, how to reframe the problem versus throw the whole thing away and start again. And I'm actually pretty impressed with the SEC. I think they've done a decent job on this topic of, of mm-hmm. yeah. changing and, and melding with the times. Other topics, maybe not so much. But this one, I actually think yeah. they're, they're really doing a good job. Okay. And I Thank do you. see a note uh, actually in the chat that that uh, I think it's Alan Wench, uh, token funder. I think he mentioned that retail investors can invest on, on his platform. So just a little plug there. Yeah, big shout out to Alan Wench from Token Funder over here. He's one of our attendees. Yeah. So and, uh, uh, I believe they are tokenized uh, 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 related real estate. Uh, so. You should check it out. Yeah. Any question? Anybody? Oh yeah, we do have one person raise hand. Uh, Lu- Louise uh, Ritkin. So I'm going to unmute. Uh, oops, I cannot. Some for some reason I cannot. Um, uh, oh, okay. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hi everyone. Yeah, I just, you know, I just think that, you know, maybe the regulators are put in the chat, right, that maybe they're trying to slow things down because they don't know how to deal with the idea of using blockchain as opposed to what we've been doing for, you know, decades and millennia with fiat. I don't know what you guys think about that. Because they can't deal with the regulation. They don't know how to catch up. You know, it's a problem, right? Well, I think if you, you know, look, blockchain is, what, eight to ten years old? maybe, arguably, yeah. and the yeah. financial markets are 400 years old. Yeah. So I think we have to, we gotta cut them a little slack. And, and the revolution, you know, just this little simple idea of an indelible ledger managed by consensus, who could have thought how much revolution that would create? And so in many ways, I think they're blown away by the speed of this and they're yeah. They're really concerned that they're going to get it wrong, but at the same time, they don't want to make any big decisions that that move markets in ways. You know, they really want to be last, not first. <laughs> and I understand that, but the, the problem is, is we need sandboxes, we need sort of places for things to develop and innovate, and that's really where I think they've they've not done a great job of really. And they're starting yeah. to do this now. They're starting to think about this, but I just think at the end of the day, they had a big lobbying machine telling them to kill this. It was for crime. And I, I think yeah. that that was the message for a long time. And only recently did they realize that, you know, it wasn't all well for crime. But, uh, thanks for that, Louis. Thank you. Um, so like going to a question from the, the chat, there was one posted at 7.08 uh, from Peter uh, Diekmeier. Uh, uh, this is posed to Richard. Um, any thoughts on the implications of the newly announced A16Z fund, particularly their investment <laughs> targets, as outlined by Chris Dixon? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll you too. All right. So this is quite embarrassing. Chris is a friend of mine, but I actually haven't read that blog post. <laughs> it's on my to-do list, but I haven't read it. Um, I'm, I am somewhat familiar with the fund. I, I, I'll just comment on a couple of big broad strokes and I'll leave the, the details for maybe, you know, one-on-one if you want to ping me on, on Twitter or something, I'm pretty accessible. Um, A16 a year and a half ago was my inspiration in many ways. I think that they were the first VC fund to really embrace digital securities and the sort of blockchain in it all or nothing kind of way. 
And what most people don't realize is that many of the partners and employees of that fund have gone and become certified to be broker dealers. They've sort of gone, they went all in in many ways. So the, sure. the announcement of the fund is the end of a long journey where they want to view liquid and illiquid assets on a level playing field as they're investing according to their thesis. And, and I think that's brilliant. I wish I could do it. And one of the challenges when you're an early fund manager is educating your LPs about new instruments versus, you know, how much do you want to change what you're doing and, or they just want to look like everything else they're doing, show them how good you are and then start to get more creative. I mean, you know, I think Anderson Horowitz, does anyone know what fund they're on now? I think it's seven, it might be eight. Mm. So, you know, and, and Mark did found a couple of companies like Netscape, so he's got some chops. So I think that that is really what I see in the world is that A16 is indicative of where things are going whether they're early or right on time, I don't know, the market will tell, but I'm really proud of them. And I think they're, I love them as investors. I think they're a phenomenal uh, of investors. And, and Chris is actually a friend. Uh, so yeah, like any, anybody uh, want to ask questions, please raise your hands on the, um, on the, um, the, the chat function. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, um, the, the, the chat box, the, the text box fields, right? And a lot of the questions that were asked earlier on to, uh, to Tony, like you guys, like, uh, you and Matt, Tony, like really took care of that, like asking on, on the side. So uh, I think we satisfied those questions earlier on. Um, so yeah, like before, before we conclude, um, it, because it doesn't look like there's a, anybody else. I just want to give uh, someone in the, the room a chance to share a question or share any uh, thoughts. Yes, anyone want to make a comment uh, before we leave? Uh, you can raise your hand so we, we can we can uh, talk any, you know, it don't have to be a question. It could be, you know, any thoughts from, from this today's session. Yeah. Uh, there's actually two just came up. Thoughts? Um, we'll, we'll leave it at, at these two uh, for, for the, um, the questions from the chat box. Uh, thoughts on, from, this is from Linda Montgomery. Uh, thoughts on Grayscale's $37 billion fund. I, I hope I read that right. Is that, is that a question uh, to the panel? Uh, any, any, any panelists have any thoughts on the great scale? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I think, what, I mean, Grayscale, I like what Grayscale does, right? Um, I think they do a, good, a, a lot of really fantastic research and it, it, <laughs> it seems like, you know, they're, uh, they're a conduit for institutional investors that maybe can't directly invest into crypto assets. And so mm -hmm. as a result, you know, you did, uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of what you're investing in is like pretty overpriced, right? Uh, if you look at, for example, their Ethereum fund. Um, but, you know, I get, I get why, why uh, I think it's good for Grayscale. I think it's, with the, with what they've put together does have value right here and now and 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 on the same maybe similar topic i mean i think one of the the great things about uh in toronto ha right now is the uh, 3iq fund bitcoin fund that we have here mm -hmm. i think that's kind of a, a good sort of uh positive like example for uh global uh, financial managers institutions that are looking at this space and uh um, I think these things have their place, so um, good for them. Yeah, so I, I'm a fan of Grayscale. Uh, I'm also a fan of Multicoin. And I mean, I think there's a bunch of people doing very similar things. Um, and I think, you know, Gemini is a great example of someone. I think that actually one of the areas I would criticize the SEC and the SCS, C, CTFC as well, um, as well as actually the UK and Canada as well, is the sort of slow, the slow drag on ETFs and, and crypto mm -hmm. ETFs. Because I think that actually is a thing, it's a product that consumers want. 
it's a product that can be regulated in a safe way. And I, I think it's just foot dragging for no good reason. And so arguably, I think these are instruments that have, we've reached the time where the, it's time for these things to see market. And I think they're gonna start seeing in places like the UK, Switzerland, probably Canada before the US. But I do think before the end of this year or next year at the latest, we'll see you know, many approved uh, crypto e uh, ETFs. Mm. Although we've been saying this for five years, so. Yeah, well, hopefully it moves this time. So yeah, guys, we are at 7.47. Uh, in, in the interest of like uh, respecting our panelists' time, like uh, I, I wanna say like a big thank you to our panelists for uh, coming out tonight and for attendees for Zooming in alongside with us uh, during, uh, during the uh, uh, happening this week. And yeah, it's been a great discussion. Great hearing that there are opportunities for Canadian investors and rather founders here in Canada. And uh, yeah, you're, and just great hints that you know we need a we do need a national blockchain strategy here in Canada to to even like scale up how uh, Canada's ecosystem can grow. Um, mm -hmm. So for let me put this in. So yeah, we just letting everybody know this video and this talk here will be on YouTube. So subscribe to Bitcoin Bay Media. We'll be releasing this sometime next week. For you guys who uh, you uh, uh, tuned in today, you guys uh, got it in before the world did. And uh, yeah, if, if you wanted to also hear what um, the, uh, the earlier discussions uh, were, talking about Tesla and talking about uh, airlines not necessarily being here as much as they are in, in, uh, in the past, uh, check it out in the earlier parts of the video. And um, yeah, at that, uh, a big thank you to our panelists, a big thank you for uh, uh, Gaurav and Victor for putting this all together. Uh, us here in, in Toronto are very grateful. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, See you guys. next time. Yeah. Stay safe and uh, happy happening, guys. Cheers. Happy happening. Yeah. Cheers. Take care. Bye, guys. <laughs>